Hello, my name is Nicole, and thank you so much for taking the time out to listen. Today is one of those fiery messages, so brace yourself. The title is Lazy, Arrogant, and Insensitive Leaders. Oh, no, do we know some? They're all over the world. They're even in your backyard, over at that local business somewhere. Oh, yes, we've got some lazy, arrogant, and insensitive leaders from the church to the boardroom. When we think of some people who are lazy, we think of people who don't like to get the job done. There are duties, there's responsibilities, but they're always putting things off because they don't feel like doing something. That's laziness. Arrogant leaders, leaders who think they know everything, prideful, the type of individuals who believe themselves to be God. They expect people to bow down in so many different ways. Maybe not literally drop to their knees, but when I tell you to do, you jump up and do. Insensitive. These are uncaring people, cold hearted, yet they put on a good act, don't they? Oh, I care about you. I love you. Get out of here. You can use that on somebody else, but I know you. I know you well. Some of you all, you're like the prophet Malachi, and that's where we are today. God has you rebuking family members, friends, people on the job and elsewhere for doing unrighteous, immoral disgusting, despicable, unethical types of things. And when you rise up speaking the kind of truth that God has put upon your heart, even without saying one thing about God, the demonic knows that you're that child of light. And so that's when they work that strategy to shut your mouth. There were the sinful priests that Malachi was preaching about. They were neglecting the worship of God. According to my life application Bible by Tyndale, they were failing to live according to God's will. If the priests were unfaithful, how could they lead the people? If your husband's unfaithful, how can he lead the family? If your manager is unfaithful, To the workplace responsibilities along with the people that are there and he's here, there and everywhere, then how will things ever get done? Come on. Splitting one's time between electronics and people. Hmm. When I'm supposed to be over here managing and taking care of and organizing and signing and typing, I'm spending time pleasuring myself in front of an electronic. I mean, we got a lot of that going on nowadays, don't we? So it's hard to stay focused when that's all I'm doing anymore. It's pleasuring myself when I'm supposed to be working. Some of you all are quite frustrated with that sort of thing taking place. You've even went to managers and supervisors and owners about this. And yet there is this distraction that continues to take place. We've got unfaithful priests in the church. Let's go there. We've got some priests that are more concerned about getting their sexual needs met, getting their pockets filled, getting their bellies fat getting their names on buildings. Oh, there is a hashtag me too movement that's coming for the church. That lukewarm church that God spit out. Oh, and you thought you were out of the clear. Oh, finally, they're after those secular, fleshly, self-absorbed types of folks putting all their business out in the street. Well, self-righteous minister, they're coming for you. Sooner or later, they're going to dig in your past. We might even see the video. I said about five years back that videos are showing up. Old pictures are showing up on some folks. Oh, but I'm protected, they say. Yeah, well, there were a lot of entertainers that did far more than what these priests and preachers have done. And trust you me, 
they unlock the safe. And let some information come out because you see this younger generation, this rebellious generation, they're not very loyal to occult organizations, to oaths. (laughs) They're not very loyal to contracts and so forth because, well, I saw that it took daddy away from me when he was a part of this group. And I can't stand this group. Innately, they can't stand the group. They'll take the monies. They'll take the fame. They'll take the fortune. But deep down inside, they hate the group. And God has allowed this sort of thing to happen. Okay. He has allowed it because sinful priests do sinful things. And part of the sinful things that they do is that they neglect to worship God. And they don't live according to God's will, even though they've prayed, even though they've asked God for his intervention in this person's life, in that one's and so forth. But then what about your life, priest? What about your life, preacher? What about your life, reverend? What about your life, deacon, deaconess, prophet, prophetess? Oh, you're too good for God, huh? God is just for that broken down, busted and disgusted person over there. But you decorated in all of your fancy fur and you with your beautiful jewelry and you with your designer wardrobe and Lord Jesus, you with your big house. God speaking to you. God speaking to you. He wants you to be the type of leader that will lead God's people But he wants you to be faithful. There are those type of leaders that, yeah, they're leading God's people, but not leading them on a righteous path. They're leading them toward hell. You see. My Bible says they have become stumbling blocks instead of spiritual leaders. If the people were divorcing their wives and marrying pagan women And there are those who have done that sort of thing right before our eyes and don't want to be criticized about that. They want to live happily ever after and leave us alone. But no, (laughs) God's people are on them like mad dogs. No, we're not going to leave you alone because you are still out in the limelight setting a poor example. If the people were divorcing their wives and marrying pagan women, how could they lead their children? And so this is why those generational curses just keep coming and keep coming. No matter how much we plead the blood of Jesus, we ask that the Lord deliver. They keep coming because people refuse to change because they refuse to say that the buck stops here. And I'm not going to keep doing this. My mama did it. My daddy did it. My cousins and all this. And I'm not going to keep doing this. I'd rather be alone. I'd rather be alone. Oh, the determined priest or preacher or reverend or deacon or deaconess who doesn't want to keep falling in the trap stands up. They don't bow down, cower down, hide behind lies, secrets and cover ups. Contact the public relations team to come up with yet another story to make them look good in the media. They don't do that. These priests in the book of Malachi, their relationship to God had become inconsequential. When our relationship with God becomes less important than it should be, we can strengthen it by setting aside our sinful habits, thinking often of our Lord and giving God our best each day. That's how we keep rebounding, saints. That's how we keep (laughs) rising up when folks say, oh, you're going to stay down. You're going to fall down. (laughs) Yeah, you messed up once again. No, uh -uh. I'm coming back around again and around and again and, and around. How? How you figure? How you figure you can keep doing that? Because I gave up my sinful habits just like that. Oh, you'll be right back. Oh, And then you give it up again and you give it up again until eventually it's not even a temptation. It's not even a fleeting. It's not even a fleeting thought. I'm giving it all to you, Lord Jesus. I'm surrendering. You see, all of these songs that they sing in the churches. It's interesting how they will sing them, but then their lives don't reflect what they're singing. God's love. God's love is evident in the book of Malachi. Here's the oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. With regard to the sinful priests. Malachi 1. Jacob loved, Jacob loved, Esau hated. Two brothers. Jacob loved, Esau hated, right? I have loved you, says the Lord. 
But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? The Lord says, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now let's stop right there. Who says that God can't hate? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his mountains into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Adam may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, and some folks plan on building churches, but listen to this. They may build, but I will demolish. Floods will come. Fires will come. Earthquakes will come. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land. The Lord said, I'm preaching to a wicked people, a wicked people that don't want to be exposed. But I'll tune in because I know that she speaks truth. God be using her. So let me just listen up. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. This is why for some of these churches that did successfully get built that haven't been destroyed just yet, they're being destroyed inside out so if you join them or get involved with certain ones that are not about kingdom business you heard through the great van it's nothing but drama and trauma but yet they offer a good meal uh some free housing um you, you know some little perks here and there so you get involved understand that every time that drama's rising up that is god allowing that sort of thing to happen his wrath is upon the church no matter how much money they get they still can't seem to get some things done you see that's an example no matter how much you offer your service there's always something that comes up that keeps you from serving that church uh oh uh oh if you are that one that every time you turn around the lord is speaking to you and it's something negative and then you want to dismiss it and say oh, i think it's the devil again no my friend nine times out of ten the lord is speaking to you about some things that need to be cleaned up but yet you got to jump through hoops in order to get those things cleaned up because the gatekeepers the devil worshipers the demonic is protecting those individuals who are so-called leading the church so even when you get next to them to tell them something they're confused their mind is warped. I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't know what you're trying to do. Oh, that's going to cost too much money. I mean, blah, 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 blah. right. They're under the, the, the wrath of the Lord. Okay. Qu simply put, they're under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes. Some folks, they don't believe sometimes when we're given the prophetic word. Not my church, not these people. I mean, I know we've been having some issues or whatever, but we're going to overcome. How long have you been saying that? <laughs> Lord Jesus. God is moving you away for good reason. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Okay. Back then, Malachi preaching. Now we're going to move on. We're still in the book of Malachi, but we're going to move on. To another example of unfaithfulness in Malachi 2. This was the warning to the priest now. And now this admon admonition is for you, O priest. If you do not listen and if you do not set your heart to honor my name. Okay. Somebody's not honoring God's name. They're honoring the man's name, the priest's name, the preacher's name, the reverend's name. Right. So the call is to honor God's name. He says, but if you do not listen, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And some folks are already experiencing that or they're witnessing that. Yes, I've already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the offal from your festival sacrifices. And it's interesting because nowadays it's all these American holidays that pagan holidays that creeped up into the church. Okay. And you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I've sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. And I gave them to him. This called for reverence. And he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. Notice that true instruction was in his mouth and nothing false. And we got the liars who for priests 
and preachers and reverends and deacons and deaconesses and so forth. Lots of liars. And they know that they've lied. They know they've covered up some things. They know they've been secretive. They know this and they continue to lie. But see, here was an, a good example of a of true instruction was in uh, his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. And turned many from sin. You see, the key to a good quality leader is that he turns people away from sin. He doesn't encourage sin. He doesn't encourage unethical behavior. You see, on the job, <laughs> Lord Jesus, he is the type of individual who wants to see the best in all. He wants you to grow, you see, spiritually, mentally, physically, so on, so on and so forth. Now, listen to this. For the lips of a priest are to preserve knowledge and from his mouth men should seek instruction because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. But you have turned. Come on, we're talking about somebody, but you have turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I've caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people. Okay. This is unfortunate, but it happens because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Okay. Now, my study Bible further explains Malachi was angry at the priests because though they were to be God's messengers, they did not know God's will. So it would make sense to pray God's will, right? And this lack of knowledge caused them to lead God's people astray. Their ignorance was willful and inexcusable. That's why you can't follow anybody and everybody on or off the Internet. These people don't bother to pray God's will. They're not getting God involved. A lot of these folks who have the so-called advice types of messages are not getting God involved. They will even tell you after you listen to them for so long that they're not believers or they believe in possibly some entity somewhere. But Either way, though, uh, this is what I think. You see what I mean? And once you hear that, that's when you got to distance yourself from that person. OK, because if they're not following God, then who are they following? Mm -mm. And this lack of knowledge caused them to lead God's people astray. Their ignorance was willful and in inexcusable. Pastors and leaders of God's people must know God's word, what it says, what it means and how it applies to daily life. How much time do you spend in God's word? Good question. You see, <laughs> and we got some individuals who they don't ever spend any time in God's word. They don't crack open a Bible. They just gone about with whatever they feel they want to talk about or whatever they feel is going to be of help, but without God, though, the priests had allowed influential and favored people to break the law. OK, and this is what happens at the workplace. That's why some of you all are so frustrated because you got managers, supervisors, owners and others who are influenced by favorites to break all sorts of rules, but yet the rules only apply to those who are not the favorites. And so when you see this sort of thing, Christian believer, okay, when you see this sort of thing taking place, that is when you need to be praying and asking the Lord to intervene. Lord, do you see what's happening? And usually God will have you do one of two things. Either you're going to sit down and confront uh, the individual about these laws or rules or what have you that they created and say, well, aren't we supposed to do this? And aren't we supposed to do that? And the handbook says this and, you know, the quality team or whoever, you know, department, whatever, um, says that we're supposed to do it this way and that way. Now, if they're okay and all right with that, they're going to say, all right, I get it. You know, this is what we should be doing or they're going to fight back. Okay. Um, and if they do that, then usually God is going to set it up where you eventually leave. OK, um, because it's a losing battle when you got a whole lot of demons in an establishment and nobody wants to change or follow their own handbook. <laughs> uh, the priests were so dependent on these people to support 
uh, or for support that they could not afford to confront them when they did wrong. That's the problem when you got a lot of toxic people that you lean on and that you eventually favor that even when they do wrong, you have a problem trying to confront them. Well, I don't want them to stop helping me. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Wrong is wrong. You want 15 people to leave the organization? No. Just because you don't want to anger one. If your church or in, I should say, in your church are certain people allowed to do wrong without criticism. It shouldn't be that way. There should be no double standard based on wealth or position. Let your standards be those presented in God's word. Now, this is the reason why this sort of thing creeps up, though. Wealth, position, oh, this is my favorite and all that. It creeps up because folks are part of brotherhoods and sisterhoods. Folks are a part of cliques and special groups. And they also have their relatives that work for them as well. And this is why you don't do this, because when you allow this sort of thing to happen, when wrong shows up, you feel obligated to support your brotherhood, your sisterhood, your family member, your friend or whoever. Rather than do things God's way. Hmm. Somebody's doing it and they think people don't know. But God's people know playing favorites is contemptible in God's sight. Now, whoever told you that it was okay and all right to play favorites between children, to play favorites between your workers, to play favorites with anyone, that person is in trouble already with the Lord. You don't play favorites. And this is what has destroyed many families as well. And then when people are told that they're playing favorites, they quickly deny it. People aren't blind. They're not stupid. They're not dumb. They know when people are playing favorites. Okay, moving on. Judah is unfaithful, right? In verse 10 of Malachi 2. Have we not all one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? (laughs) Lord Jesus, Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign God. Now, for some of you all, you may have fought up against parents when you were younger about a person that you wanted to date or a person that you wanted to marry or what have you. And some of their reasons were just unjustifiable. It was just ridiculous but other reasons were for your own good and then unfortunately later you ended up breaking up and you had those relatives that said "Mm -hmm, I told you so okay there are those people by God's design that God wants us involved with okay and there are those people that God doesn't want us involved with and It's certain people. It's not an entire ethnicity or an entire, you know, group or entire religion or whatever. But there are those individuals that we simply cannot have close to us because of who they serve. And when you get involved with occultic types of groups and associations and connections, and when you get involved with family members that's flirting around with all sorts of faith, uh, it is very easy to be influenced by them and then of course them leading you away from God and that's not what God would want you see we serve the same God but then there are those individuals though that or we are have been created by the same God but there are those individuals who serve other gods you see There's the one God that created us, but then there's all these other gods, lowercase g, that influence people, uh, the spirits that are in and around them, influence them to draw away from the Lord. And this is what happens even in the church. I thought church was a safe place. Well, (laughs) think again, when you go to church and yes, you do want to be around the like minded. You just have to make sure that you are praying God's will and that you're asking for God's protection and that you're not getting mixed up with the wrong people serving a different God. And when you do find this sort of thing out, then that's when you definitely run. (laughs) Okay. You don't need to send them a letter and say, I had to leave your church because of this, that and the other. You just get out. And then if you happen to see them on the street, you can always give them, uh, you know, an explanation. 
As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. So if you choose to go ahead and serve a foreign God, um, you're on the wrong side with the Lord. OK, you might be all, you know, buddy, buddy with those people who, yes, we all serve whoever. But at the end of the day, you put yourself at odds with the Lord. Verse 13. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. OK, some folks, they go down to the front of the church and they're just crying out. Right. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. Verse 14. You ask why it is because the Lord is acting as. Listen to this, the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her. Woo, some men, <laughs> Lord Jesus, though she is your partner, the wife of your married covenant. OK. Verse 15, has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. See, God has a plan and a purpose. Ooh, Jesus. So guard yourself in your spirit. That's what we're supposed to do. Guard ourselves right in spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. And if you don't have a wife, you shouldn't be breaking faith with the Lord. OK, bottom line. You're not supposed to break faith with the husband, with the wife, with God. I hate divorce. That's verse 16, says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Real simple, right? Mm. But you know, man, he's going to make it complicated. Let's read on to the day of judgment, shall we? You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him? You ask by saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord and he is pleased with them. Or where's the God of justice? Now we see this in so many different ways, whether it's with the government, with our family members, with friends at the workplace, people who are worshipped and honored and treated with so much dignity and respect, but they do evil. And then they're told that, oh, you're a good man. You're a good woman. No, they're not. When they are doing blatant, negative, nasty, downright dirty things, these arrogant, insensitive types of individuals, wicked, they are not good. They are not good. And you got some sons and daughters that'll say, my parents are good. Your parents was running out there in the street doing whatever with whoever you see, or my parents, they always loved me. They did this, that, and the other. Are you sure about that? You got marks all over your body. Okay. Oh, you know, uh, my, my best friend, she, oh, she's so good to me. She's so good to you by bringing you drugs and alcohol and everything else. What are you talking about? You see how twisted some people are. There's the abuse that takes place in a relationship, for instance. And the woman says, oh, he's such a good man, but he's emotionally abusive. He's physically uh, a tyrant. Uh, he, you know, does all this stuff to you. And yet he's a good man. What? Because he bought you some things. Jesus, come on now. And it frustrates us because we're trying to preach and teach and lead and educate and tell these people this is sinful this is wicked this isn't good get your mind right with the lord and you'll see what i'm talking about and they want to fight us tooth and nail jesus jesus help us help us all god was tired of the way the people had cynically twisted the truth or his truths he would punish those who insisted that because God was silent, he approved of their actions. Just because God is silent doesn't mean that he approves of what's going on at the workplace, at home and elsewhere in government. Just because he's silent doesn't mean he approves of these things. Or they even think that God's not going to punish them. Oh, no, we'll never get punished. God would also punish those who professed a counterfeit truth while acting sinfully. So telling the lie is going to get some folks in trouble from the child who sits up there and says with a straight face, I never said that I never did that to the man who says that he didn't buy this and he didn't, uh, you know, uh, um, tell this one that and whatever else. And he really did. There are consequences to pay for such lies. You see, 
Reading on Malachi 3, see, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers here. Hear me when I say this because it's still happening. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers adulterers and perjurers against those who defraud laborers of their wages who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive aliens of justice but do not fear me says the lord almighty okay okay this is coming my friends i don't know if some folks was aware of that but we are in that season where judgment is coming and some of you all have already seen some folks <laughs> have to end up suffering much because of their sorcery, their adultery, their telling lies, children as well as adults, those that have defrauded labor, uh, laborers of their wages. Oh, you want to take work from us, but you don't want to pay us. You want to tell us we are supposed to get all this paperwork done to make us legal. Uh oh, somebody's talking. They know. And so then all these things are done. And then, oh, now you want to defraud some people? I'm giving an example, okay? See, we are all U.S. citizens, and we all know what media says and what media has brainwashed us into believing. But at the end of the day, there are some people that are doing what is right. They're doing what's right, but they are being disrespected, being mistreated, used and abused, and robbed, okay? And this is what uh, God doesn't like. And so therefore, when the ugliness shows up with some people, with their own family members, then they want to play dumb like, why, oh God, is this happening? Or please pray for my family. Or I don't get what, you know, is, is taking place right now. This is so troubling because you got to look at what you did or what you didn't do. You see? There's some people who got dirty hands. They got dirty hands and God is exposing them on where their hands have been and what their hands are currently doing. And it hurts. I know. But in order for you to know the difference between right and wrong, you got to know you got to go through some things. This is what's been going on over the course of my years. In order for me to get to a place of preaching messages and, and providing advice and so forth, I had to make some mistakes. Folks think that you just go into these sorts of things with clean hands. No, you don't. I had to go through some stuff and still going through some stuff in order to reach the people where they are. That's why the messages are authentic, because I've been through it. And what hurts is when you expose yourself and you're so candid and you tell the truth for somebody to want to wash your face with it or talk about how you're not equipped or you shouldn't be doing this, that and the other. But meanwhile, you don't understand. I overcame. I'm just going back 5, 10, 15, 20 plus years in storytelling to bring to light what people are going through right now so that they will ultimately draw near to the Lord. But those arrogant, sinful, insensitive type of preachers out there, reverends and pastors and whatever else you want to call them. They don't want to expose themselves. They're very careful of not saying what they've gone through and how they got over. And it's better to have the conversation about those people over there than about them because they're still in it. They still got the carnal mindset. But I'm here to tell you that if you want to continue to be that one, that's lying. That's into sorcery, black magic and witchcraft and caught up in these various occult organizations for certain favor and influence. And you got your wicked ones that uh, you favor and esteem. If you want to be that one, that's the perjurer and the adulterer. 
I'm telling you as sure as I'm sitting here that you will end up experiencing judgment. I know there are those who have listened to the media and how they twisted some things around and made it look like all those people over there are this, that, and the other. But when you do things like defraud laborers of their wages and you oppress widows and a fatherless and deprive aliens of justice and, and all of that, and you don't fear God, oh my, <laughs> oh Jesus, he comes like a thief in the night. He allows that demonic entity to show up and take a father's son or take a mother's daughter. You see what I mean? And we can keep on sugarcoating some things and saying, well, you know, stuff just happens. And I mean, we all going to die sooner or later or whatever you want to say. Oh, no. Our God, when he does some things, he does it in his time. And he does it in such a way where it doesn't matter what the public relations campaign says. At the end of the day, we know that somebody was under a curse and somebody was doing these very things that I mentioned. And that is why they're suffering, suffering much. So if it's not the father who goes through, his son going to go through. If it's not the mother that go through, don't worry about it. When she in the wrong, oh, her daughter going to go through. I remember where when there was this woman who had no business, no business bothering me whatsoever. I was taking care of my responsibilities at home as well as at work. But she was looking, looking for any way to um, to um, reduce the budget. And she could have found so many different ways to do it. But she nitpicked. She nitpicked looking for things on, on everybody who wasn't her favorites. Okay. And the Lord spoke to me because I was so upset because I said, she even, and, and there were people, managers and everybody who said, Nicole, you did a wonderful job. I just, just so you know, I let so-and-so know about you. You did great. You did this, that, and the other. She was twisting things and, and just trying to find any way to get rid of folks to reduce the budget. Okay. And I, and, and the day that it happened, I remember the Lord spoke to me. He said, she has a daughter. That was it. She has a daughter. And one day, how she treated you, her daughter will be treated in the same way. You see what I mean? And me even saying this, I remember how I felt that scary feeling. It wasn't like, uh-huh, yeah, well, okay, all right, uh-huh, thank you, Lord. No. And even me repeating it, it's a scary feeling. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. He is not going to allow these despicable things to happen to righteous people. I know sometimes it looks like you're losing to the wicked man, to the wicked woman. I know sometimes it feels like your back is up against the wall. I know sometimes it looks like you, they should be struggling when you, when you should be free and you should be off the struggle bus. You know what I mean? But hang on because if you draw near to the Lord and you warn God's people to stay away from sin. Your blessing is coming right around the corner. You won't have to be the one that's sitting up there asking why. Why is it that he gets away with what he gets away with? Because it won't matter no more because of the freedom that God has given you to be released up out of that sin. To be released up out of the worry. To be released out, out of the stress. Preachers and teachers and leaders of all sorts are called to do some things. And those things are the things that are the will of the Lord. And when behind the scenes, they're not doing what is right. The will of the Lord. There are consequences. And even though you may not see the consequences right now, trust you me, they do come. They do come. There is the faithful few. Over there in Malachi 3, verse 16, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. 
Verse 17, they will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. I will spare them. Somebody said, have mercy upon me. The Lord says, the mercy's coming upon you. I will spare them just as in compassion. A man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteousness from the uh, between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Let me repeat that. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Okay. And the day of the Lord is coming in verse four. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogance and every evil doer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who re- revere my name, the son of righteousness and that son, S-U-N, of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out. Come on. This is a word for somebody. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Okay, this is very real around the world in various communities. Okay, so even if it doesn't resonate with you, somebody is saying hallelujah and thank you, Jesus. Okay. And uh, I did reference uh, Elijah. Uh, Elijah was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. Uh, and there is a story that you can refer to is in first Kings 17 and also second Kings two with Malachi's death. The voice of God's prophets would be silent for 400 years. Then a prophet would come like Elijah to herald Christ's coming. And that's in Matthew 17, 10 through 13, and also Luke 1 and 17. This prophet was John the Baptist. John prepared people's hearts for Jesus by urging people to repent of their sins. Christ's coming would bring unity and peace, but also judgment on those who refuse to turn from their sins. So if God moves on a man or a woman to speak to someone, let's say out on the street, about Jesus, okay, and that person refuses to listen. Nine times out of ten, there's a judgment that's coming. Because why? They refuse to turn from their sins. You see, because if I'm coming to you and I'm warning you about something, and this happened to me, okay, over the course of my years where it was strangers as well as people that I knew that came to me and was warning me about different things. And some of them didn't know me from Adam, but they knew, <laughs> they knew what God had put upon their spirit to speak to me. And before long, there were some consequences that I had to deal with. There was some judgment. And so when you repeatedly are told things as a teacher, as a father, as a mother, as a prophet, as a priest, a leader, of any sort, and you don't want to listen, please stop saying, why, wow, Lord, confess your sin and repent and get away from that sinful lifestyle, sinful habit in Jesus mighty name. That's what you're supposed to do. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I'm not even worthy to be teaching anyone, but Lord Jesus, you know me and you know the error of my ways. And I ask, Lord Jesus, for your mercy to be put upon me, Lord, and I will do what I'm supposed to do. And then you do it in Jesus name. You do it. You don't just say, oh, I'm going to do and then don't do. Some people made promises to God and then they ended up backsliding, backsliding to the point where now they don't know this. But in the spiritual realm, they are so close to hell. So close to hell. If they were to die within minutes. It's a guaranteed place for them because you see, you got to be careful what you're saying 
to the Lord in your quiet time under times of pressure. Uh, you know, those moments where you feel like you're always losing and then you say, but Lord, I'll do this. If you help me with, you gotta be careful saying them kind of things because God, he is a God of his word and he expects you to be that way. <laughs> you see, and when you're not, oh my goodness, the day of judgment tends to come a little bit sooner rather than later. We got folks who robbed the Lord. The Lord said, I do not change in Malachi 3, 6. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. We got family members that they not only turned away, but they taught others to do the same thing. And the Lord said, return to me and I will return to you. Before some of them, some of them left this earth, their spirits left this earth, they returned to the Lord. So some folks got their information all backwards and mixed up. Oh, my, I know he went to hell. Uh, excuse me. If you wasn't there leading up to the last days. They returned to the Lord. I'm a witness to one of my relatives. She turned to the Lord before she let, checked out of here. <laughs> you see. And it wasn't a deathbed faith. She always had faith. It's just that she knew that she had made some uh, uh, errors and she knew that she had to repent of those errors and so she returned to the Lord but you ask how are we to return will a man rob God yet you rob me and they like to use this scripture all the time when it comes to money but you can rob God in so many different ways you can rob God of your time uh, um, of, of time with him you can rob God of you know uh, energy that you should have had reserved for him but you tired out because you were so busy uh, doing something during that time that God was saying, no, I need you to do this thing over here. You see. But reading on because money is going to be mentioned, but you ask, how do we rob you? He said in tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of of you because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And I did test the Lord in that. I said, OK. You said to bring some. Some money to the church. I heard you and I, I heard what amount. And even though the amount was small, I still had a little bit of an attitude. I'm going to be honest with you. And then the next thing I know, I went on and I gave that money and I and I kept giving that money because I said, you know what? I said, this is this is ridiculous. Just because something happened to me long ago or just because I witnessed some things, I'm not going to be falling under any type of curse. When God move on your spirit to give, you're supposed to give. And so I went on and I did just that. Next thing I know, I ended up getting all sorts of things over the years. Blessings of wisdom is top. It's top. And some of you all, you have been witnesses to that sort of thing. Where'd she get all this knowledge? Where'd she get all that wisdom? Uh, because I was obedient. That was one of the blessings that came back to me. See, people always talk about material wealth. Did I get a car? Yes, I got a car. What else? Uh, I ended up relocating to everywhere that I even so much as thought about, imagined or what have you and continuing to move around and do all sorts of stuff. Well, what else he do for you? Oh, well, he provided me with healing when I was really sick and thought I was going to die. What else he do for you? I prayed. I asked about um, having sons. I didn't want daughters. You got sons. I got four sons. You see what I mean? What else God do for you? How long you been with God? I've been with God ever since 1997. Did I have my share of difficulties and trials? Did I have my backsliding moments? Absolutely. But yet I still got up and I kept pushing and I kept fighting. Oh, OK. I, I wanted to know because, you know, <laughs> there is something to that giving in. Absolutely. I'm a witness. So if God move on your spirit to sow a seed, whether it's. On this channel or anywhere else, understand that there is things that come back to you. I'm telling you, and it may not be the thing that you had hanging up on your wall in the same color, okay, style and by that designer, but it, it'll come close depending on what it is that God wills. Because sometimes the very thing that we think we need isn't what we need. It's just what we want. And God says, that's not even workable. That's not even feasible. Why did you even ask for that? Well, I just wanted it. Just because you want something doesn't mean it's right. And meanwhile, there's a whole lot of other things that you need 
So let me bless you on the things that you need. And we can talk about what you want later. Ooh, Jesus. So that is it. Those wicked priests, leaders, reverends, or what have you. Judgment is coming. You heard the bulk of this message. And for those that don't want to be caught up under the curse, don't be falling under the, um, uh, after those types of teachers. And if you know that there is something that you want God to do, then you need to be obedient and do what he's been moving on your spirit to do, including giving. And I know that some people get attitudes about it, but there ain't no sense in getting an attitude. God said, test them. <laughs> Lord Jesus, and those tears will start coming down your eyes when you see all those blessings coming to the point where you you don't even have room to put another thing in your house or in your apartment or in your car. God is good all the time. So thank you as always for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen. You've been listening to YouTube in Enterprise 7. May God richly bless you as well as those that you love. Please do check the description box for anything that might be of interest. And you are welcome to subscribe, like, comment. To God be the glory.